Well, we're in the book of Mark, and we're in chapter 6. So we've been kind of walking piece by piece uh, through this journey. If you're just starting, I want to remind you to go back and watch. There's so much that I wish you could see and wish I could bring into the story today um, so that you see the full picture of who Jesus is. But that's the heart. We want to really dive in and look at Jesus's ministry, who Jesus is, and Praise God who he is today uh, for you and me. So um, we've been walking with him. And one of the things I want to ask is, have you ever had somebody say to you, or maybe you've said this, um, if I only saw Jesus, then I'd believe. Or if I just saw a miracle, then I'd believe. Or you fill in the blank. Some statement where you go, oh, man, my faith or my ability to believe is really dependent on something else. I need something to see. Have you ever felt that in your life or talked to somebody? Um, that's not uncommon. In fact, if you've noticed in the story, the disciples are walking with Jesus and they're still trying to figure out who he is. Even though he calmed to see, even though he's raised up this young girl from the dead last week, even though all the signs are happening, they continue to question who he is. And it reminds me of this Hungarian doctor, Dr. Similwis. And, and he was a doctor back in the 1800s, 178 some years ago, uh, he was working in a maternity ward, and he noticed that the mothers giving birth were dying at an exceeding rate, just not normal for most hospitals. And he began to observe and pay attention to the, the practicing doctors. There was a, a school for doctors as well, and so they would be doing autopsies, and they'd go from the autopsies to the delivering room, and they wouldn't wash their hands, and they wouldn't have any, uh, you know, anything to do with that. And so what happened was he started to observe. And so he began to tell the doctors that I want you to wash your hands. Now, how many of you right here would say washing your hands is pointless? Is there anybody that might agree to that, that oh, you shouldn't wash your hands, doesn't matter, uh, you'll be just fine? If you are, please use caution if I ever have lunch with you <laughs> or if you serve me something to eat. I'm going to ask you to please wash your hands because I think there's great value in washing our hands. And at this particular time, this was not common practice. And it might surprise you that the doctors in his area, despite the evidence that when they started washing their hands, they would add some bleach, chlorine water to that as well. And as they washed, the death rate of these mothers went down drastically, almost non-existent. So despite the evidence of that the go from the autopsy room, wash your hands to the birthing room, despite the evidence of the survival rates increasing dramatically, many doctors refused to believe that it was a practice that they should be a part of. The evidence was right in front of them. In fact, their pride got in the way. Many of them were disgruntled. Oh, you're accusing us of killing these mothers. That's the, the heart of somebody who is resistant or closed off to evidence right there in front of them. And so have you ever had somebody say, I would believe in Jesus if only there was more evidence? We're going to see in our story today that that's not true. Even despite evidence, many refuse to believe and one last thing about this hand washing, it might surprise you, it wasn't until the 1980s where the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, began to really adopt the hand washing idea and then broadcast that in an effort to see people not only more healthy in their general hygiene of daily washing, but certainly in the medical community. Over a hundred years go by and hand washing, despite the evidence, continued to be just a challenge. And so in our story today, we're going to see this challenge unfold. And so follow with me as we jump into the book of Mark, chapter 6. And just a reminder of where we left off. Jesus had been doing ministry, Sea of Galilee area. He had just got done coming off the boats. He was preaching. He was healing people. He even had this daughter, this Jarius, the daughter of Jarius, who had passed away. And Jesus showed up and with great calm said, She's just asleep and raised her up from the dead. And so as he leaves there, he's now going to his hometown of Nazareth. 
So let's kind of pick up that as he enters into the hometown in chapter 6. It says, uh, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? We have to understand something unique. Think about the perspective as we enter into the story. Jesus returns to his hometown. This is the town he grew up in. So he's, you know, around 30 years old at this time. So 30 years in the hometown as a carpenter, uh, working with wood and stone, most likely, um, probably well known in the community, especially since even by the age of 12, he was already very wise in the scriptures and people were marveling at his understanding at a young age. And imagine going away, doing ministry, people are talking. This, his uh, the information about Jesus, you have to know, was coming back to his hometown. Did you hear? Apparently, he healed somebody. Apparently, somebody was demon-possessed, and they've been freed. And then he shows up in his hometown, and he begins to teach, and we see the people who are listening. It seems in this moment that they're questioning, who is this Jesus? They've got good questions. Where did he get these things, and where did this wisdom come from? You hear this repeatedly. They're amazed. They're astonished at who Jesus is. And they ask some more questions. Let's continue on. They say, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not this his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Well, well, hold on. Wait a minute. What, weren't those good questions? When I first read this in the years that I've read this, I often see it from a lens that they're inquiring, oh, is this him? Who is this guy? Isn't this him? But then you read, and they took offense at him. In other words, they're saying, who does he think he is? Let's read it from that perspective. How are such mighty works done by his hands? Who does he think he is? Isn't he just that carpenter guy? Isn't he the guy that fixed my door or put the steps in at my house or whatever? Isn't that him? He didn't go to rabbi school who does he think he is? Isn't this the son of Mary? Now, pause for a moment, because in all likelihood, Joseph, his father, has passed away by now. In fact, in that culture, it was, and many cultures I travel today, it's still the practice of associating yourself to your father. So he may have, you know, he was, uh, Jesus, son of uh, Joseph, there would have been some kind of connotation. But in, in this moment, aren't you the son of Mary? So Joseph, I would agree, is out of the picture. But there's more to that moment, perhaps. Remember Mary, the story of Mary. This is the young girl we uh, celebrate during Christmas, the story of Mary, the Virgin Mary. And so in the community, I'm sure there was still skepticism about her virginity, that Jesus perhaps was seen as an illegitimate child. And so you begin to hear perhaps an undertone, not of an of inquisition, like, who is this? Like, wow, I want to know more, but more of a derogatory. Look, he's just got normal brothers and sisters. There they are. They're right here. And it says they, they took offense at him. How could this be? Who does he think he is? Does he think he's a rabbi? Does he think he's a prophet? You can hear, perhaps, that their hearts are very resistant to receive who Jesus really is and what he has to offer. And so Jesus, of course, being Jesus, he's hearing this, and he's patiently wanting to love on this people. He then begins to speak to them. In verse 4, and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. 
There's a lot going on here, but think about just the general sense. If you unpacked this idea about a prophet is not without honor, it says, well, most people are honored everywhere except their hometown. I don't know how your story is. I know my story. I didn't grow up here in Douglas County. And in some ways, that's probably really good because if you were sitting listening to me or if you knew me as a child through my high school years especially and in my young adult years, you might say, who does he think he is to tell me about Jesus? I know who he was. I know what you did. But they wouldn't have that against Jesus. They would have had nothing but, yeah, he was always perfectly good. Like he never stole anything. He worked hard. He was honest. But that wouldn't have been my story. So for me to go back perhaps and, and teach in my hometown would have been very difficult in my early years. And even today, those that knew me, those that know me, they might have questioned who I really am. Am I sincere? But, but Jesus is basically saying, look, I'm not surprised. I've returned home, and I'm not surprised that there is no one who will look to me with any kind of honor. See, you're blinded by my past. You're blinded by the history of who I was as I grew up. But I'm here with a different perspective I need you to see. And the second part that's interesting here, it says that um, he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So oftentimes people, when they read this, they say, look, look at this, his power was limited. This isn't a story about a limitation of, of Jesus' power. It's really a story of unresponsive hearts, hearts that were resistant to the truth of Jesus, hearts that looked at Jesus and questioned everything about him and were unwilling to surrender their own minds and their own hearts to who he really is. Because of that, Jesus had nowhere to go. Like there is a, There's a reality. Jesus was using the works of saving, uh, excuse me, of uh, removing demons from people of healing people, of raising this young girl from the dead from the story last week to reveal his identity. Well, if you're not going to accept the evidence, how much more could he do? If you won't accept that people were truly freed from these demons, if you won't accept that this girl really was dead and now is alive, if you won't accept that he really healed the paraplegic What's left? What more can he do? All he's left with is words. If his actions aren't enough evidence, how could his words be? So in other words, there's, there's no further confirmation available for those unwilling. And so the limitation was a result of an unwilling heart. And so I want to draw out something really critical, though. It's that Jesus desires belief. Jesus desires belief. You could even say Jesus demands it. It is a requirement if you want salvation in him. It is, the foundation is faith and belief. Remember the beginning of Mark, he says, repent and believe. Jesus desires belief. And what really stands out to me in this passage at this moment is this statement. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Can you put yourself for a moment in Jesus' shoes? How much more can I show you? How much more can I teach you? How much more can I reveal who I am through the very scriptures that you've studied your whole lives, many of you? How much more can I do? And, and what I would do <laughs> is I would get angry here. And now, the book of Mark, it doesn't say what else happened in the conversation right now. All we're left with is that Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. But I, I think he must marvel in such a way of a broken heart. Gosh, what else can I do? It is my desire that you would come to repentance, that you would believe is my desire. And I just marvel. There's, I I'm, I'm, can't do much else for you. Oh, I wish you would look at what I've been doing, the evidence. And so for you and me, I think Jesus has the same, the same cry. He says, ah, oh, you have my word. You have the, the evidence that my resurrection was real. The tomb is empty. Praise God for that. How much more do you need? Because 
In fact, I, I'm afraid to say that many, even now the disciples still in the journey are questioning who he is despite the evidence. And you and I have incredible evidence, not only of God the creator and his creation and his power, but of the resurrection of Jesus, the power and authority that he has for redemption, for salvation. What, a, what an incredible moment you and I sit in. And so here's my question for you is, do you think that Jesus marvels at your faith or do you think he marvels at your unbelief? Does Jesus marvel at your faith or does he marvel at your unbelief? Like when you have conversation with Jesus, is is he going, wow, I can't believe you trust me with your finances. I can't believe you trust me with your son or your daughter. I can't believe you're trusting me with your work situation. Does he marvel at that and just sing over you? Or does he shake his head in disbelief? Because he puts you in a community where his word's available in your language, where videos and teaching are available, where believers are gathered around you, and yet you're still seeking for something else to make one more evidentiary statement of proof. I just need one more something. I think Jesus would say, am I not enough? In fact, faith doesn't always make sense. But based on what I'm showing you today, what you're reading, what you're seeing, isn't that enough? You're always going to have questions but what's your heart posture when you think of Jesus? Are you still trying to untie every unknown knot, every confusing thought in your brain? Or have you finally found a way to just rest in faith and work with God through all the confusion of how to follow him and how to live with him and how to relate to him? Jesus desires belief. And I think this incredible moment, he says, he marvels at the unbelief, but then it says, and he went out among the villages teaching, and he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. So here's this moment where Jesus is going to make a shift. And it's a really intriguing one for me. As I was studying, I hadn't really thought about it from the perspective. He just got done saying, there's so much unbelief here. There's not much I can do. And yet it's time to begin the mission of the church. Now we know that it's the book of Acts is really where we see the day of Pentecost and the spirit of God comes upon the believers and the church is birthed. But this is setting up the foundation for where Jesus will send out his disciples just like he sends out us. And take a look at what he says to them. He says to, um, he gathers them and he gave them authority over unclean spirits and he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bags, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. See, here's this incredible moment. He gives them the mission, go out. And now let's just pause and think about the disciples. If you were one of Jesus's 12, at this moment, you've only watched him cast out demons and probably it was a little intense. You've only watched him raise people and heal people. And now all of a sudden he says, you're going to go do it. That must have been an awkward moment. Like, what do you mean I'm going to go out there? I'm going to go and be a part of somehow I'm going to do what you do. And Jesus says, this is what I need you to do. I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you power over unclean spirits, these demons but I need you to go with limited supplies. One, because I need you to rely on God for all your provision. This is a faith step moment for you. Take the bare necessities and watch and see what I do. Two, it's gonna force you to interact with humanity. You're gonna get hungry and you're gonna have to talk to somebody at some point because you're not gonna have any money. So it's an opportunity for you to be served by people. And as you do that, some will invite you into their home. But I want you to wear minimal amount of gear. And there's kind of this rabbi rule, this idea that you're not to show up with any kind of appearance that persuades people in one way or another. 
come in as neutral as possible, ready to share. Now, notice what else he says in verse 10. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. So Jesus says, look, you're going to be dependent on God for provision. I'm going to provide. God will provide through these people's houses you will stay in. But when you get there, I want you to stay there until you're done in that town. Don't go house hopping looking for a better meal. Receive whatever is given. And as you're in that home, begin to share. Do you ever think about this? And we were talking in the teaching team. What do they share though? They didn't have the Bible like this, like you and me. They had scrolls. They had the Torah at the time. But we're reading the pages that <laughs> today that were being written in history, so to speak. So what do they share? Many of them, most of the disciples at this point aren't believers, according to the scriptures. So what are they sharing? They're sharing what they're seeing Jesus do and how they're experiencing Jesus in their life. Isn't that simple? Isn't that beautiful? Like, just share what Jesus has been doing and how you're seeing Jesus in your life. And through that process, what's going to happen is that household owner is going to say, wait, you're saying that Jesus has been removing demons. My friend is struggling with demonic possession. Do you think Jesus would help? And these guys could say, not only that, but he's given us authority to do that. Imagine how the movement of this would have gone out. When Jesus said, go, I'm going to send you on a mission. And this is kind of an interesting moment for you and me. I want you to, to hear this, but let's finish and we'll kind of catch up at verse 11. He says, and if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, Jesus expected rejection. So should you. Don't be surprised when people say, I don't want anything to do with that. Don't be surprised when they say, you're out of your mind. Don't be surprised when people look at you and say, I don't believe. And that's true for you and me. And then this idea of shaking the dust off, there's a lot of cultural history to that. But let's just take it simple, shake it off, and move on. Don't get caught up in the emotions of it. Remember, your job is to cast seed. God's job is to produce fruit. My job is to share the truth of the gospel. God's job is to redeem the souls, to bring salvation into the hearts of those who would repent and believe. And verse 12 says, so they went out, and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. What an incredible, powerful moment. Here they are, the 12 disciples, sent out in twos, and they begin to do, by the power given to them at this time, do what Jesus was doing, proclaiming the gospel, calling people to repentance and belief and performing these miracles. So I want to kind of press in here and just make this point that Jesus does the equipping. It's Jesus who does the equipping. We're so tempted when we hear about Jesus to say, yes, I want to follow you, and then to put our boots on and try to get to work to show Jesus how good we are. And what I want you to hear today is Jesus is the one who does that equipping. It's not in our energy, and it's not in our strength. In fact, remember it says he gave them authority for a season. And you and I receive an incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. When we place our faith in Jesus, he said, you will receive the Holy Spirit. And when that power comes upon you, not only will scripture be revealed to you, but you will be able to be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, in Douglas County or wherever county you're in that you have authority to do that because of the authority in you. But look at what Jesus says directly. Look at the equipping of the disciples. He called them. He gave them. He gave them authority. It says he charged them and he said to them, he, he says, here's what I need you to do. Here's what I'm asking you. See, Jesus is the one who develops. Jesus is the one who empowers. And Jesus is the one who deploys them and you and I. It's Jesus who does the equipping. And we can find great confidence and comfort in that, that we don't have to work hard to fulfill the ministry 
The ministry is the outpouring of Jesus at work in us. I hope that gives you some confidence. It means that you can go and be, be kind, be generous, be gentle to people, speak truth in love. Let them hear the gospel, not only in the way you live, but out of the words that you speak. And trust that as you do that, the equipping in you is what God will use in the people you interact with. Jesus is the one who does the equipping. It's so powerful when we have this moment in time where we have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I think what you see are these disciples are saying, look, this is good. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> have you ever felt that? This is really exciting, Jesus, but, but I don't know how to do this. The beauty is that because this is a journey we get to be on with the Holy Spirit, the more we begin to just live and work and relate with Jesus, the more it begins to show up in our life. The faith grows and he empowers us and he develops us and he deploys us. And sometimes you're deployed and you didn't even know it until you get home and you go, Wow, look at what just happened. Look at the experience. Look what that person, they just received Christ. Third thing and last thing they're going to close with today is that Jesus calls us to obedience. Jesus calls us to obedience. This is a, an invitation to a relationship with God because of incredible grace that he pours over us. Why wouldn't I want to live in obedience with him because of what he did for me? He calls us to this incredible, natural, beautiful response to God. God, because of your saving grace, because of your sacrifice that you laid down your life for me, the only natural outcry should be, I want to live with you and for you and be on mission to show the world who you are. To live in obedience is such a beautiful gift that we're given. And once again, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to do that. Not your obedience, not your hard work, not your ability to stick to it. The Holy Spirit's power in you at work. And look at the disciples here. Look what he said. He says, so they went out. Look at their response. Jesus charges them. He equips them. So they went out and they cast out these demons and they anointed with, with oil and many were healed. Once again, they responded in obedience, but it wasn't because of them that demons were cast out. It wasn't because of them that people were healed. It was because of the power given to them by the equipping work of Jesus that this was the outflow. Their obedience led to lives being transformed in the power that Jesus brought. And so our behaviors reveal our beliefs. According to this, did the disciples believe they had power? I would say yes. They went out in obedience. I'd say, yes, they saw people healed. They saw demons driven out of people. I don't think it was probably without a lot of hesitation. I'm sure there was confusion and question and wonder. Is this really going to work? This guy's freaking me out. Like he's, he's all over the place. This healing, this person is so sick. They've been sick their whole life. They're 50 years old. How could I possibly have that much power? And yet Jesus says, it will be my power for my glory. I love the idea of obedience because obedience is the response to grace. And so as I was kind of studying, I was reminded of this from Dallas Willard. He, he was a theologian and he said this, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. The, the life of obedience is not an effortless journey but it is opposed to trying to earn favor with God by your obedience. God just says, if you'll trust me, my grace is sufficient. I've completed everything you need. I am the fullness of who you, I am is now available to you. And grace is not opposed to effort. And because God's grace, I desire to be obedient. And the more that I get to know him, the more I just want to say yes to him. 
I hope you've experienced that in your journey as, as you come to faith and you begin to wrestle with, with just how Jesus wants to transform you. I know the journey can be hard sometimes where you're like, I really don't want to be obedient to that, but something in me desires more. And I believe that's where grace begins to show up. And we can trust that God's work in us will bring us into the best person he wants us to be, the desire of his heart that we would repent and believe and we'd live on mission with him so that others could receive life in Christ. I love you guys. What a, what a fun time together. I hope that you go encouraged today. and I'm going to release to the campus pastors and let you kind of close together. This is uh, one of these stories that as I was walking through, I just marveled. Uh, I thought a lot about my own journey. I thought a lot about what it meant to live a life of obedience. And I remember the, the early years of my walk, um, there was a lot that God was doing. I noticed it because where I had come from, there was a lot of cleanup. The cleanup on Isle Craig was, was a big deal. I remember uh, specifically I was I was watching one of my favorite movies. This is just that, that moment. I'm new to faith, and i like, oh, i got to watch this movie. And as I watched it, the profanity and the images haunted my brain. My heart just was hurt. As what used to be my favorite movie now became this, like, offense to me. I was like, why is this? What has happened? And so I turned the movie off. And I threw that movie away, and I realized that this was the process of God calling me to obedience. And you know what the, the fruit of that was? One, I didn't watch it anymore, so I was free. And two, I didn't get in, engaged in that kind of, that type of movie again. It just, it just wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for my soul. It, it wasn't good for my mind. But also, it wasn't good because it didn't glorify God. It was a struggle I, I went through, and I just remember time and time again, it happened again with the music I used to listen to and, and all these pieces that, that grace was at work in me. And the result of that was a life that I continue to strive for in obedience. I wish I had perfected it, but praise God, he's still working on me. I got a ways to go. And so I wanted to leave you today with just this idea about how do I live a life of obedience, but covered by grace? And we've been talking about the blessed rhythm for a year now, over a year. This is just an approach to living a life on mission with God. And so I just want to walk through that with you and challenge you. As you think about the disciples who went out, what's your life like when you go out or when people come to your house? And so the B here is to begin in prayer. I want to encourage you to, to daily and situationally begin in prayer. God, I'm about to go into Costco. Help me have ears to hear and eyes to see those who you might bring in contact with me. Because I get in there and I'm like a horse with blinders. I got a mission. I want to get it done. And God might say, and in fact, yesterday did say, I have someone I want you to visit with. And so B, begin in prayer. The L is just to listen. Learn to listen to the Spirit's leading and learn to listen to others. One of the things about evangelizing or sharing your faith or loving people is you don't have to come in ready to preach a message. You have to come in with answers they don't have questions to. Listening is about listening. What are they wrestling with? How can today God be a part of their journey? And perhaps this will lead to a prayer time with them and to pray over someone. The E, of course, is uh, eat together. And this is really about a relational idea. Um, food is a great way to bring people together. So serve people and let people serve you food and eat and fellowship together. The S is to serve, and this is a confusing one, to serve people, not just by, um, you know, doing chores, but sometimes sitting with somebody in a grieving time or visiting them in the hospital, serving them. And then here's the hard one, letting them serve you. When you're struggling, let them serve you. And finally, sharing is about ultimately sharing how Jesus is transforming you and the truth of the gospel. I love you guys. I hope that you're being challenged as we walk through the book of Mark and as we go into just a really beautiful summer. I hope you have time to get away and re replenish your strength spiritually to get rest as you think about the works of God in your life. And I'd love to just pray with you as we close today. Father God, thank you for those who right now are listening and maybe they're traveling or maybe this is just where they're at. God, I pray that you'd use these words today to draw people to you, to see that all the evidence is available, God, that you're coming to earth and just living a beautiful, perfect life 
And then, of course, being the ultimate sacrifice in our place, receiving the wrath, dying and rising again, fulfilling the scriptures so that we could have life in Christ if we would place our faith. God, I pray that each one here has received Jesus, and I pray for anyone who hasn't, that today they would open their eyes and their heart to the truth of who you are. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. See you later.